This is Professor Anna Ryan Spiha from the University of Alaska Southeast, and this is a lecture on the assumptions and issues with the free market model. Here in this lecture, we will talk about what are some of the main differences between alternative economic models and what are the strengths of the free market. We will begin by, first of all, talking about the assumptions of the free market model and the assumptions and issues, but only as it relates to ecological economics. We'll start first with the microeconomic issues of the production function and the utility function. Then, in the next chapter, we will focus on many of the assumptions and issues as it relates to macroeconomic issues. In Module 3, Unit 1, we describe what a free market economic system might look like and the benefits to an economy for relying on a free market model. Let's review what we mean by a free market capitalistic system. It's an economic system that's based on private ownership, free markets, and letting people make economic decisions. Producers and consumers are driven by self-interest. It's assumed that producers want profit while consumers want the best products at the lowest costs. Now, there is an important role for the government. It's technically supposed to be limited, but it's important because it does collect taxes and redistribute those taxes, mainly to build infrastructure and to do any kind of redistribution that may be required. Now, it also offers other very important services. It regulates economic activity to ensure there is fair competition and no monopolies. With a market economy, we need laws and regulatory policies in place that manage in direct greed and the profit motive into productive means that ensure prosperity and that stabilize growth. We need to protect and build a nurturing economic environment that protects and preserves the self-correcting mechanisms and dynamics within the market, which of course then allows the invisible hand to perform its job of allocating goods and services efficiently. Laws that protect private property, competitive markets, transparency, and accurate information flow within markets all ensure that no one group usurps our democracy by obtaining too much economic power by destroying the mechanisms that guarantee a free market economy. So in a free market economy, what to produce is determined by consumers' preferences. How to produce it is determined by producers seeking profits, and for whom to produce is determined by the purchasing power of individuals. This is how we describe a market economy. A free market is one in which individuals about what to produce and in what quantities are made in the market by buyers and sellers, negotiating prices for goods and services. The price tells producers how much to produce. And how are prices determined? Well, in a free market, prices are determined through negotiations between individual, many individual buyers and many individual sellers in the market. Let's compare a free market economy versus a command economy. A free market economy is controlled by private owners, those that own the factors of production, land, labor, and capital. A command economy is controlled by the government. In a free market economy, the government has little influence over economic activities, while in a command economy, the government has full control over all economic activities. Now, in a socialist economy, of course, it's not full control, but it certainly is a large deal of control over all economic activities. In a free market economy, a market is based on the division of labors. In a command economy, no division of labor is generally involved. In a free market economy, the price of goods and services is set by supply and demand. But in a command economy, prices are determined by the government decision makers. In a free market economy, the ownership of the factors of production, land, and resources are with individuals or firms. On the other hand, with a command economy, land and all resources are owned by the government. In a free market economy, demand decides the quantity of output. But in a command economy, the government decides the quantity of output. In a free market economy, income distribution is not similar. But it's fairly equal within a command economy. Fairly equal income distribution practices are generally practiced. 
So capitalism is generally described where the individual is the most important and is characterized by private or corporate ownership of capital goods by investments made by private decisions and by prices, production, and distribution of goods determined by the free market. The community is generally supported by volunteering and the government is assumed to be very small, while all the goods belong to individuals. Now, socialism lies in between communism and the free market economy. And in socialism, the community is considered the most important, and it's characterized by collective ownership of capital goods, by investments made by a collective decision, and by prices, production, and by distribution of goods determined by the collective. The individual is much smaller. The government is very big, and the goods belong to the government. Now, communism is considered a full-fledged command economy. Now the government is the most important, and it's characterized by collective ownership of capital goods, by investments made by government decision and decree, and by prices, production, and by distribution of goods all determined by the government. The community is supported by government. The individual here is very small with very few rights, and the goods belong to the government. So the free market, well, it's received a bad rap these days, but I think it's all due to what's happened in the United States. So let's try to be clear. I don't think it means what you think it really means. Here is a great quote by geeky.us. Some think it means powerful business running amok. That's actually a dominated market. Dominated markets can only happen when big corporations staff government agencies and write their own regulations. This gives them power they wouldn't have in a free market. A free market is one not dominated by big firms, big business, embedded in government. And as Robert Francis Kennedy Jr. once said, Today, more than ever, it is critical for American citizens to understand the difference between the free market capitalism that made our country great and the corporate cronyism that is now corrupting our political process, strangling our democracy, and devouring now our national treasures. So I want to leave you with one very important thought. Our textbook comes across as an attack on the theories that support free market economies, and market capitalism. So after reading this textbook, you might be inclined to say, well, drat, I guess we need to use some other economic model to run our country, as clearly market capitalism is a big failure. But we need to be very careful here. This would be very much like saying there are a lot of problems with democracy, and heavens, we know there are. So let's all abandon democracy and turn to what? Socialism? Communism? See, there aren't a lot of options. Winston Churchill once said, many forms of government have been tried and will be tried in this world of sin and woe. No one pretends that democracy is perfect or even all wise. Indeed, it has been said that democracy is the worst form of government except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. So here is the problem. Market capitalism is far from perfect. But the problem is we're only left with a few other choices, socialism and communism, both of which rely on central control of all resources, including labor, and redistributing the goods that the central command centers decide should be produced to the populace according to the Politburo's discretions. And importantly, how goods are produced is out of the hands of consumers. Now, Think GMOs, pesticides, and environmental pollution. Labor is considered a resource owned by the central planners. Now, I was in China in 1989 and 90. The students there were not allowed to fall in love in college because they could be, quote-unquote, assigned for the rest of their lives to jobs at the other end of the country. I am not a big fan of any other system that does not support democracy. In a market system, consumers vote for how and what they want produced, not a centrally controlled, quote-unquote, politburo. 
Now, keep in mind, we do not have anything close to a market capitalism system today. In fact, we've not had one for quite some time. And we don't even have correcting the problems to get us back to a capitalistic system on the agenda. Where we need to begin to restore our capitalistic economic system is to begin to enforce our antitrust laws and break up corporations, and perhaps even the banks, into smaller independent units in order to restore competition and pull the power of decision making away from an elite few. So let's talk about how to fix our current system. Keeping all of this in mind, but be aware of what you are giving up when you ask for a new economic order, because it may come at a very high cost. We need to think about this. There are a number of assumptions that are critical in order for a market economy to exist. In fact, many of these assumptions are violated within our own so-called market economy. And when these assumptions are violated, we cannot assume that we will receive any of the benefits that come with a free market society. In fact, when even one of these assumptions is missing, markets will not deliver the best results. Perfect competition is probably the more important limiting assumption for a free market economy. Without the ability to assume perfect competition, we cannot conclude that the economy produces efficient results. Perfect competition describes the perfect world of free market capitalism. It really doesn't exist anywhere except in an ideal state or perfect world. Perfect competition assumes that there are a large number of buyers and sellers all in the market. A large number of buyers and sellers ensures that no one has the ability to control or impact the price. The price is set and determined with many sellers and many buyers interacting and competing for the ability to purchase or the ability to produce and sell profitably. What this means is that everyone in the market is a price taker. They go to the market, look at what price has been established and ask, can I produce and make a profit with this price? Can I implement new technology and improve my profit margin before others catch on? And the buyers start asking questions like, can they afford this price? Or if the opportunity cost of the purchase is too high and if they choose to use their funds on some other product. To see the problems that occur with this assumption, one only need to look at the effects of Walmart on local small businesses. To many sellers in the market, each of whom produce a low percentage of market output, they cannot influence the prevailing market price. So each firm has to take the market price, or in other words, is a price taker. But in reality, in today's economy, there are many large firms, corporations, and monopolies who control a large percentage of their industry output and thereby influence prices. Another famous example, of course, is the pharmaceutical industry, or even agribusiness. They have amassed sufficient market power to be able to affect market prices. Walmart is known to influence suppliers by driving down price and margins to levels that competitors cannot maintain. This is often referred to as the deep pocket pricing strategy. It is assumed that the role of the government to make sure that the marketplace rules or that the rule of law is enforced actually occurs. By using antitrust laws to ensure competitive markets continue to exist is an important role for the governments. Yet many corporations have such complete control over the market that they're able to amass not just profits, but they also amass political clout and often use their power to buy off Congress, thwarting our freedoms and usurping our democracy. They will also act in ways that is considered lawless, using the so-called deep pocket approach where a company with large reserves and profits can easily bankrupt a smaller competitor either by suing them or underpricing them until they are bankrupt. There are other assumptions like free entry and exit in the market or in other words, that there are no barriers to entry, it's also assumed that all agents in an economy are rational. And finally, it's assumed that there is perfect information. And finally, equally important, it's also assumed that all factors of production are perfectly mobile 
and are able to move about in the economy according to the wage, rent, or interest provided to the factor of production. Again, when any one of these assumptions are missing, markets will not deliver the best results. And when markets do not produce efficient solutions, inevitably this also means that prices for natural resources and the services that they provide will not accurately reflect scarcity. This can easily result in overuse. Inefficient outcomes include the possibility that many resources and the services that they provide can end disastrously with complete destruction without some form of government interference. The point here is that we cannot rely on the market if any of the assumptions are violated, and this means that if resources are becoming scarce, we will not be able to rely on the market prices to inform us. We must now rely on government intervention to protect these resources and to engage in other forms of managing natural resource environments. Of course, another possible solution would be for the governments to step in and restore free markets. Free markets in the invisible hand does not mean that governments stay out of the economy altogether, as is often argued by many. This is not what a free market means. Free markets require the governments to enforce the rule of law, protect private property, and to ensure that concentrated economic power does not occur by breaking up monopolies and ensuring that there is competition in the marketplace. But here we are going to focus on two major assumptions that result in inefficient solutions. Due to the inability of the neoclassical model to appropriately account for first, externalities, and secondly, the inability of the neoclassical model to appropriately account for the nature of natural resources, both as a flow and as a fund service, as factors of production in the production process. Consider the standard neoclassical production function. Capital Q is equal to some function of capital K and capital L. Where capital K is capital, things like buildings, computers, tractors, office space, etc., and capital L is labor. K and L are assumed to be substitutable, perhaps not perfectly. And capital Q, well, that's output, goods and services, from a firm. Capital F is a production function. It takes the inputs, the factors of production like labor and capital, and does something to them to produce output, which we're calling capital Q. Fundamental to this production function is the idea of a diminishing marginal product. What this means is, is that as we increase the factors of production while holding some constant and changing only one, eventually the output will start to diminish. Let's think of a farmer with fixed land and capital, say one tractor and one acre. As labor is increased, at first, output increases a lot. But as more and more labor is added, output begins to diminish. Farmers on a fixed acre with one tractor can only handle so many workers working the land before everyone begins to get in each other's way. So output may continue to increase, but at some point, one more laborer will produce not as much as the last laborer was able to add to output. Here's an example. We start with zero farmers and they produce zero bushels of hay. When we add one farmer to say one acre and with one tractor, one farmer produces five bushels of hay and this means the additional marginal product is five. Now with two farmers, 11 bushels of hay are produced and now the marginal product going from one to two farmers is an additional six bushels of hay. So the marginal product is six. But notice what starts taking place after four farmers, that it appears as though we've reached a max at some point. Five farmers, now we only get a marginal product of five. And look what happens when we have six farmers. So when we go from five to six, total produce in terms of bushels of hay go from 29 only to 30. So the marginal product at six farmers is only one. The moral of the story here is that when we go from four farmers to five farmers to six farmers to seven farmers, 
our marginal product declines from 6 to 5 to 1 to 0. Labor added less output than the additional worker before them. Output only increases by 6 with 4 farmers and after 7 farmers added, output stays the same. Output increases but at a decreasing rate for each labor added after 6 farmers. 7 farmers adds no more to output. Eventually, the marginal product goes to zero and output is not impacted by one more labor. If labor is continually added at this point, the output will eventually begin to fall. This analysis depends on whether the factors of production are considered a substitute or a complement for each other. If they are a perfect substitute, then holding the other factors constant does not act as a limiting factor on output. For example, suppose tractors and labor are perfectly interchangeable. I don't know, maybe we have a Paul Bunyan or a Wonder Woman as laborers and they can do exactly what a tractor can do. So when you add Paul Bunyan and Wonder Woman, you're essentially adding two more tractors. Well then, marginal product is not likely to be impacted that much. Adding more labor is likely to continue to add more and more output. But at some point, the acreage is going to bump into a limitation. So where land and labor are not substitutes, more land will eventually be needed before more output can be produced. What all this means is that as long as the factors of production are considered substitutable, each increase in the factor as the remaining factors are held constant will increase output. But then at some point, they are no longer substitutes and then output begins to decline. Neoclassical economists, according to Daly and Farley, focus heavily on the assumption that factors of production are substitutes and not perfect substitutes, mind you, but eventually output begins to decrease as more and more of the factor is added when the others are held constant. But it is assumed that they are not perfect complements. And this is unique to ecological economics. So remember what a complement is. A complement means that you cannot have one factor without the other. Shoes need shoelaces. Factories need both raw materials and labor. You cannot add labor without adding raw materials. According to Daly and Farley, and I quote, the poorer a substitute for factor A is for the other factors being held constant, the sooner the marginal product a falls to zero. And if A is really a complement to the other factors being held constant, then the marginal product is zero right from the start. Production functions exhibit both substitutability and complementarity because factors can be complements. But standard economists tend to see mostly substitution, whereas ecological economists, they emphasize complementarity. Why? Because ecological economists put different things in the production function and assign different qualitative roles to the different factors in the production process. For instance, neoclassical economists treat all inputs the same, labor, capital, and resources. Ecological economists insist on a qualitative difference. The neoclassical economic production function abstracts from the difference between material resources and efficient labor and capital causes of production and considers both to be absolutely equivalent. Ecological economists insist on a distinction. So now let's consider the ecological economist production function. Now we have Q again as output is equal to a function of capital N, capital K, capital L, and little r. Capital N will be natural resources. Capital K will be as before, capital, capital L will be as before, labor. And now we have once again little r. Capital L and K are funds of labor and capital, while little r represents flows of natural resources. Capital N stands for natural capital, which exists both as a stock that yields a flow of resources, for example, a forest yielding cut timber, and as a fund, a forest yielding the service of watershed protection for wildlife habitat. Now recall our distinctions among fund, flow, and stock as well as service. Remember that funds are unchanged in the production process while flows are altered. 
A stock, like raw materials and nature services, is a productive input that can be used to generate flows at any rate, while a fund, like labor, can generate services up to some maximum rate. This makes the production function a bit different to the ecological economist. For example, the ecological economics production function incorporates the fund flow distinction. Now, it is assumed that among the factors of production, there are complements. For example, funds and flows are complements. We can assume that substitution may take place within each category, say within labor or within capital, but we cannot assume substitution across or between them. The stock fund the stock function of yielding a flow of resources is captured at little r, but capital N is assumed to be but capital N is assumed to represent a fund function of providing some indirect service that contributes to the transformation of little r into output Q, just like capital and labor provide direct services in the production of capital Q. Now, according to Daly and Farley, a good example of this might be a forest cover providing the service of water catchment to recharge aquifers used in irrigated agriculture. Used in irrigated agriculture. And this is as much a capital fund service to agriculture as is the fund of pipes and sprinklers used in irrigation. In other words, stock and flow natural resources are neglected entirely in the production function of the neoclassical economist. But here, they are not only included, but it is assumed that they are complements and work together synergistically among the factors of production. Again, to the neoclassical economist, a flow of output is seen as a function of two funds, or two stocks, that are not decumulated or drawn down. So the correct description of a production is actually a, just a transformation of a resource inflow into product outflows, with stocks or funds of capital and labor functioning as the transforming agents. Again, I quote, it is clear that while one material cause, resource, can often be substituted for another, and one efficient cause, labor, capital, can often be substituted for another, the relation of efficient cause to material cause, of agent of transformation to material undergoing transformation, is mainly one of complementarity. Ecological economists emphasize this latter relation. Neoclassical economists misses it entirely. Resource flows are complementary with man-made funds, and in a full world, they can become the limiting factor on the production function, as they become increasingly scarce. This is the challenge we face in a full world, and it should inform the economists that it is wise to maximize the productivity of the limiting factor in the short run and to focus on investing in its increase in the long run. Unfortunately, our models have not kept up with the changing times. The pattern of scarcity is not being accounted for within our production functions. Natural resource flows and services generated by natural capital stocks and funds become the limiting factor. Again, for example, fish catches are not limited by man-made capital of the fishing boats, but by the remaining natural capital of stocks of fish in the sea and the natural fund services that support their existence. If our production functions reflect this, we would be more inclined to economize on and invest in this important limiting factor. Now we turn to the consumer utility function. The utility function suffers from much the same problems as the production function. While the production function underlies the supply curve, the utility function underlies the demand curve. Demand curves are constructed by consumers' utility curves. Neoclassical economists assume that consumers have the sole goal of maximizing utility by pursuing the most satisfying products at the best available price. The utility function is based on a level of satisfaction on a given combination of goods and services, or in other words, from a flow of commodities that we call goods and services. 
This utility that is received or generated from some combination of purchased or consumed goods is assumed to be only related to the goods and services themselves. The utility function is maximized against the budget or income constraint with prices given. This maximization process identifies the combination or bundle of goods that generate the maximum achievable utility. And this is how it is determined what set of goods are purchased by an individual. Here we are consuming bundle A because it's the highest utility or indifference curve that can be reached with a given blue budget line. So we consume A of shakes and of pizza with a utility that's realized at 100. Quantities demanded are then summed across all individuals at each possible price to obtain the aggregate or industry demand curves. But this utility function does not account for consumer satisfaction that results from services of directly enjoyed natural capital funds, the provision of breathable air by a well-functioning atmosphere, the provision of wilderness for opportunities of solitude, primitive recreation, to loosen the grip of civilization, to restore the bonds of nature, and of course for adventure. These unmeasurable services are not accounted for in the consumer bundle of a neoclassical utility function. But we could do this much like we did for the production function. We could let capital N refer to the natural funds in the same way that we did to include the transforming funds of L and K in the production function. According to Daly and Farley, Direct service from capital N is not just the pleasure of a beautiful landscape, although that is included. It also and primarily refers to the basic fitness of our environment, to our organism that supports our life and consequently supports our consumption and want satisfaction from commodities. We have evolved over millions of years and into a relationship with our environment. A relationship of complementarity between capital N and ourselves, including most of our artifacts, which are extensions of ourselves. And so we're going to rewrite the utility function as an ecological economist would. So if X is a pair of hiking boots, then clearly utility is dependent upon good places to hike, capital N. If Y is a snorkeling mask, its utility depends on reefs and clean water to swim in. Not to mention prior dependence on breathable air, drinkable water, sunlight filtered of UV, etc. Natural Capital Capital N provides a complementary service without which the utilities of most consumer goods are not very great. If we only consider X, Y, and Z, we could argue that there is substitution among these goods. That is, we may be able to maintain the same level of utility by consuming less, but only by consuming more of Y or Z. Substitutability is maintained among the goods X, Y, and Z, but complementarity is assumed between capital N and X, Y, and Z. So our utility must fall if capital N falls. With this utility function, we will not be better off by consuming more of X, Y, and or Z. Quote, the use of capital N as a stock that yields little r is likely being pushed beyond sustainable limits. Consequently, we may lose not only capital N in the stock sense, but also the services of capital N in the fund sense. And those services are complementary with most consumer goods. So reduced capital N will mean reduced utility from X, Y, and or Z. Our next task in Module 3, Unit 3, will be to focus on capital N, the goods and services that nature provides. And we're going to learn that these types of goods can't really be allocated easily using a free market economy. And it's due to the natural characteristic of these kinds of goods. These types of goods have characteristics that just do not allow for an efficient allocation using a free market. So until then, this is Professor Spihar from the University of Alaska Southeast.